Greetings, I'm Marvin Daniels. I'm the Executive Director and CEO of the Hope Center located right here on the east side of Kansas City, Missouri, sandwiched between the uh, Benton Boulevards and Linwood Boulevards. And to my left is Marcellus Casey, my COO of the Hope Center. I'm really happy to be here with you all um, and really glad for the work that God is doing on the east side of Kansas City and also really glad about you all's interest in justice and how um, from the vantage point of Johnson County, you can also see what God is doing in other parts of the city. So we're glad to have you partnered with us. And then to my right is Angie Daniels, who's the Senior Program Manager here at the Hope Center. Hi, I'm excited to be here with you all. Thank you for inviting us into the conversation. It's a topic that we're really, really excited about discussing as well. So looking forward to it. You know, when CORE asked us to be able to begin a seminar, or provide a seminar opportunities, we was trying to talk about a little bit of what should we really, really talk about that draws the body of Christ in because we really are, um, as, as individuals sitting before you, we're part of the body of Christ. And so the body of Christ for us is critical and central. So we started talking about topics and one of the things that we recognize that becomes really sensitive in the culture and particularly as it relates to the church is when we say things like white privilege or white fragility. And so today we don't want to talk about white privilege or white fragility. We want to go from the topic of white leverage. How do we leverage in the culture individuals who have influence, authority or power on behalf of another. And I think together as we talk about this, that we're gonna look at it from the letter of Paul to Philemon. There's nobody, no place even great in scripture that really addresses how do we leverage our roles, our responsibility and our relationships in our culture, in our families, wherever we are on behalf of someone else. And so Philemon begins by just sharing um, out of this letter where he's in prison that somehow, some way Onesimus, when he left uh, and fleed from Philemon as a slave, that he ran into Paul and they began a tremendous relationship with each other. So much so that Paul states the fact that, that Onesimus had become dear to him. He's a dear son in the faith. And so he uses this letter to Philemon, and by, by the way, it's not a private letter, this is a public letter. He addresses it to Philemon, he addresses it to Philemon's wife, he addresses it to a co-worker, and then he says to the church that's meeting in Philemon's house. And so it's not a private letter to Philemon, it's to the church overall. And he tells them just simply, he says, I'm sending back to you one who's become dead to me, Onesimus. We, I know when he left you, he was enslaved to you. But now I'm not sending him back as a slave. I'm sending him back to you as a brother. Now get this, this is where um, Paul leverages his, his re relationship with Philemon by telling Philemon, listen, you owe your life to me, but I'm not doing this, I'm not asking you this or demanding this of you. I'm sharing this with you, knowing that because of love, you will be able to receive back to Onesimus, Onesimus to yourself as your brother and not as a slave. So when we talk about this thing called white leverage, um, Celis, when we talk about white leverage, uh, what comes to your mind as it relates to, in your own experiences in the culture with the church, uh, how do you see leverage being beneficial to others? Yeah, I, I see leverage being beneficial to others um, mainly because um, it brings people together in unity. Um, when the North won the Civil War um, and the Union had defeated the Confederates, um, Ulysses S. Grant did something really particular. Um, before um, he signed uh, the treaty and they made peace with the South, um, before he sent the Confederate um, generals and, and colonels and lieutenants all away, he actually gave them 
um, their horses. They were able to keep their horses and they were also given um, financial resources in their loss. So what Ulysses S. Grant knew was, hey, for us to remain together as a country, I need to use my power, even though we won the victory as the union, to keep the country together, I don't wanna send these men home with nothing. The only difference is, is that for enslaved Africans, once, once we were freed from slavery, we weren't given the exact same opportunity. So as we think about um, two different races coming together, as we think about people coming together, we have to use positions of power, positions um, of, of resources, and give that to others um, so that there is unity. Yeah, oftentimes what we find is that uh, especially when you talk about race in America, that it seems that race has, is incumbent upon those who are oppressed or impacted by race to have the responsibility to address race. But that's not what Philemon received from Paul. Paul says, look, Philemon, you, know, you have the ability to enslave or have Onesimus as your bond servant, and so you have the responsibility to set him free. Mm -hmm. So Angie, as you think about that, um, the responsibility that the predominant church like the white church in America has to address the areas of injustices and all, what's one of the ways that you've seen it either play out or you would suggest um, for individuals to use their benefits or their leverage on behalf of others? Well, I would say a lot of the white churches have uh, opportunities galore, uh, and they have the resources, as Marcellus just mentioned, uh, and they have the connections, and connections are really, really important uh, in ministry, uh, especially for the church. Uh, and so there should be, as the body of Christ, uh, when somebody's struggling, when one person is struggling, we're all struggling. Uh, and uh, when you see the dis disenfranchised individuals uh, not having and you keep silent or you uh, turn and look away, you don't consider others better than yourself, uh, then, then, then again, that poses a problem for the church. But what I really do love is when the body actually connects and are unified and when we align with one another and when you see individuals, uh, despite cultural groups or differences, they see a need or a cause and they come alongside of you and say, hey, you are my brother and my sister in Christ. And they say, whatever you're doing, we're gonna lend a hand and we're gonna be here for you. And that builds the body up. And so I love body life when you don't even know an individual but they come alongside you and what we see here at the Hope Center, they come alongside and they serve and we serve one another and that's what it should look like. Yeah, well, some of the best examples we do have is with our partner churches, uh, where we've had individuals, a church who's given us over $10,000 in gift cards so that we can take these gift cards and empower our families who have specific needs that they can go and shop for because we had those resources. Mm -hmm. Or individuals who have done a, a toy drive on our behalf, that we could bless children uh, with specific toys that are specific to them culturally because this particular partner was able to do a toy drive on our behalf. So when we talk about justice, we don't just talk about it from a cultural perspective. We really talk about justice from a kingdom perspective. And when we really talk about kingdom justice, it's when God's authority supersedes cultural norms. So that's what we look at is that we look at God's authority that supersedes cultural norms. And when we say that, we recognize even in Rome during that time, slavery was normative. And so Paul wanted them to understand, even in Eastern European culture at that time, that when I send Onesimus back to you, I want you to do something that's outside of the cultural norm. And therefore, because he's a brother in the Lord now, that you ought to embrace him as an equal brother in the Lord. Not a brother in law that ought to be subjugated once again as a bond servant, but one who would now come alongside of him as his own brother. Amen. And so when we look at the, the culture, for instance, Sellis, and, and we look at uh, oftentimes how we deal with this sensitivity issue of, of the fragility of talking about race, mm -hmm. you know, what is another way that as the body of believers that we would say even to our fellow brothers and sisters who are watching this today,
that we can see the benefit of the church again, uh, doing something different than the culture when it comes to lending their voice to society. For instance, we, you know, we hear a lot of people talk about, you know, and we, we share in this, and that is, you know, we believe abortion is wrong. And so we advocates for pro-life, mm -hmm. but we don't go silent when we see children in our community that's being killed by gun violence. Mm -hmm. you know, and so oftentimes in the culture, you know, we speak to the culture on one thing, but then we grow silent on the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really important for the church to set the standard. You know, when we think about, you know, the NBA or the NFL or Major League Baseball or even other uh, social entities that are leading in the regards of not only equality, but equity um, and also giving people um, resources and opportunity to be heard and to be seen and to be resourced. I believe that the church needs to lead the culture. And so that's really what you see Paul doing um, as he is writing this letter to free Onesimus. And, and one of the things in particular that, that Paul Paul does as a church leader is he says that, hey, whatever is owed, whatever, whatever Onesimus owes you, whatever debt he has, he says, I will pay it. And, and, and so he reaches out of his own resources and says, I will make this right. And so as, as, as a church, we have to figure out ways to make things right. Um, we have to figure out ways um, to, to give resources, to give time, to give um, people and attention to areas um, that may not have a voice in the same way that other areas have. Huh. So you mean that then Philemon had to enact the justice that Paul had invited him to on behalf of Nisimus mm -hmm. and utilizes his resources to do that. You know, Psalms 11, 7 says, for the Lord is righteous and he loves justice. The upright will see his face. Mm -hmm. When you think about, um, thinking about the church in itself, our body of Christ and believers in the culture, what are some ways that uh, you would suggest that the church can display acts of justice, um, not just to the culture, but to the body of Christ? Um, one big way is probably just to communicate. I mean, it sounds real simple, but communication uh, and connection actually does mean a lot. And so uh, you know how it is when you see somebody hurting or somebody grieving or individuals who are dealing with trauma. Uh, most people say, I'm silent because I don't know what to say. Uh, but those who are mature in the faith and those who uh, actually want to grow and want to be uh, more Christ-like are those who actually take a risk and say, you know what, I don't know what to say. I might not be skilled at this conversation, but I'm still willing to care. And, I, you know, scripture says also, you know, uh, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we as the church, as the body, if you've been a part of body life, you know a lot of scripture, you know a lot of the word, you know what the word says about justice, you know what the word says about equality, and yet we know it but we don't really experience it because again, the other part is the love builds up. And sometimes I, I think the church can be absent of love um, because we know so much, because we are so knowledgeable of the truth of what scripture says. Um, but the bigger issue is that do we really apply truth to our own personal lives when it comes to uh, acts of injustice or just speaking up and speaking out uh, you know, silence is complicit. Silence is violence. You know, silence lead to uh, unjust acts uh, when individuals don't step up. I love uh, the story of the Good Samaritan. Um, it's one of the most powerful stories in scriptures to me uh, because it shows just the different individuals who saw what happened, a very unjust act, and yet they walked away or they crossed the street or they did something different. Uh, and the Good Samaritan was a different uh, cultural group person. Uh, and he and this d decided to step in and not only to step in, but step in and as you all were saying again, lend a helping hand, not just step in, but provide the resources to say, hey, this brother is hurting, you know, he needs some help. Let me actually get him to a place to end. Let me pay for the bill. Let me go the extra, extra mile 
uh, in my faith because it's only the right thing to do. And I do believe, like I said, we know uh, individuals who know the right thing to do, but I think as all of us, are we gonna really step up and do the right things? We hear conversations, we hear racial slurs, we hear racism, and sometimes we just don't call people out on it. We just kind of like, oh, I wouldn't have said that, or that's not cool, or that's not right. But then we just leave it there and then we don't address it and then it continues um, and it just continues on and on for generations to go. So Yeah, wow, think about that. So for generation after generation, we find individuals, we, we're stuck in these aspects of racism or prejudice or bigotry simply because we didn't do acts of justice, right? And so, and you stated that acts of justice actually lends itself to the concept of love. And that brings me back to what John said in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. He said, dear friends, let us love one another. Why? Because love comes from God and everyone that loves are born of God and knows God because God is love. In essence, the way we intercept or interrupt language that we know is not from God or of God as it relates to people is we have to love God first and foremost enough to be able to display that love to our fellow human beings. But in, in this particular context, we're not just talking about loving folks um, in the culture, we're talking about even loving folks in the church. He says, if you don't love your own brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, enough, how can you display that love outside of the body of Christ? And so we have to interrupt language. We have to interrupt actions that take place in the body of Christ that we know is not of Christ. That we know are wrong, that we know uh, hurts the dignity of humanity, that we know um, begins to offend, that we know. And so we should not allow uh, acts of injustice to rest upon the one who's been the recipient of the act, but the one who's actually the, the, that displays the oppressor, the individual who displays the act of injustice. Mm -hmm. So when we think about that, um, we're sitting here in uh, one of our churches, church buildings that we have the privilege of owning um, at the Hope Center. And this, this building here, we wanna see live again. It's, it's almost the, the act of justice that we want to see happen in this building is that it was vacated and it's it decayed, but as a result, we want to see it live again. We want to see it rebuilt and remodeled inside. We want to utilize this place that we're in to display the love of God to our community in ways that bring families together, in ways that um, brings youth together, ways that bring our community together. And this space has the opportunity, affords us the opportunity to display that kind of love and action um, to our community. It's a historical building. It was built in 1904, finished and completed in 1924. It sits right here on the corner of Linwood and Benton Boulevards. Um, and people see it because grandparents sent their children here at one time. It, it was a pinnacle in our community. But now as they watch it decay, they're just wondering, this decay kind of lends to the hopelessness in our community. So we got to see this, this building live again as just an act of justice to our community to let them know that we love you and we want to utilize this facility that was created for the purpose of worship, for the purpose of love and action so that we have the opportunity to display that once again in our community. And so when we talk about love and action, you know, what are some of the, what are some of the ways you find it was really difficult for the church to display love and action? Yeah, I think, I think it's difficult. Um, even when you look at the history of the church in America, you know, the reason why there are black churches is because black folks weren't allowed to go to church or to worship in an equal way um, with their white brothers and sisters. That's, that's, that's where we had the inception of the black church. So I think that there are many things um, in our nation's history 
that we just that we have to realize that we have to understand that we have to repent of. I mean, as great as it is that Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and as great as it is that um, slaves were freed on June 19th of 1865, I mean, one of the first things that Abraham Lincoln did was he invited Frederick Douglass and many other African-American leaders to the White House. And he said, OK, what's the quickest way to get black folks back to Africa? So even with the freedom of, of, of being no longer an enslaved African in America, but you, did, you also didn't have folks that wanted unity, that wanted us here as equal citizens, as equitable citizens. So as the church, we have to think about ways um, to, to realize that, to, to really come to grips with the depth of the divide um, that, that has happened in our country, not only economically, not only geographically, but also spiritually, a, a great, great divide um, that, has been, that has been put in between what should be brothers and sisters in Christ. We, we're talking more than just generosity, right? We're talking about um, taking systems that existed only for a particular people and breaking those systems and expanding those systems so that everybody benefits. Um, you know, we talked about this as well, again, these acts of injustice that takes place, but as the body of Christ, what do you feel is our responsibility as well, as Celis was talking about, to display love in action as God would have us to do? Uh, I would say to invite more than one person in. Uh, I think we all know how it feels to be the token black person uh, or uh, white evangelicals to say, oh, I have a black friend or I have one or two black friends instead of saying I have a community of black brothers and sisters uh, in whom I have relationships with. So I think it takes more than just having that one. Uh, I would love, you know, for opportunities I went to and all black college and then I transferred to an all white institution as well and so I saw the disparage between the two and uh, and I know the church play, played a role in it as well and so I'm like you know Marcellus and Marvin I'm like man if we could have more of our young people uh, being able to go to seminary at a young age you know not just inviting a scholarship for one or two people you know in the church body or those who know somebody that know somebody Body, but actually say like, hey, like we want to actually enroll a number of individuals to actually come in and get the education and get the training and get the skill set that's necessary so that they can be forerunners so that they could actually lead and be leaders of the church in the future. And so we do have to change our paradigm. I think you actually have to think differently, uh, not just one, uh, but many and a lot. Uh, and as you were saying before, leverage is like, uh, still is the building up. It's almost like I have to take a back seat. If I have this leverage, let me allow myself to take a back seat so I can thrust somebody up uh, and so they can be lifted up and so they can have opportunities to grow and to expand and to invite those others in. So. I love it. I think our children have uh, a generation different from ours where we had to be the tokens or we had to be individuals who it was always just one of us in seminary or one of us in the classroom. Uh, but our children got a chance to be exposed to be in diverse settings where they get a chance to go to school with white and black and Asian and Hispanic individuals. So their worldview is a whole lot different. When they actually say they have friends, they actually have friends of all nationalities. Uh, and it's beautiful to see. And Again, I think we're missing that in body life uh, because we're so separated and, you know, we're, we, we are. Uh, it, it's, we got a lot of work to do, but the encouraging part is that I really am looking for the next generation of believers to uh, actually move us forward uh, so that we can actually begin to really do some things that will honor God. And I do agree with Marcellus. We do have to come to a point where we are repentant of the sins that from the past just so that we could actually move forward and to, to own it for the future. In conclusion of our time together, we, we always try to give some examples of how we can display love in action through acts of justice. But this organization, the way it is right now, had that actually displayed. 
Uh, the Hope Center, when this was actually founded in 1998, uh, was founded by a group of white individuals from Johnson County who had a heartbeat and a vision to come into the inner city of Kansas City and they wanted to make a difference. And so the staff of this organization was predominantly white. Um, and so when, as they continued to grow um, and, and recognize that the nefarious systems that prevented students from becoming world-class Christian leaders uh, was hindering them, they recognized they needed to do some things differently. And that's when they got engaged with the Christian Community Development Association and learned some aspects of community development and the importance of battling these nefarious systems. But then at the same time, um, as things started to implode organizationally from one action to another action, um, I was asked to pray. Um, the predominantly white director of this organization and this staff, it was the insight of that director, who was a friend as well, who said, Marvin, would you consider coming and leading this organization to a place that I could not? And as we prayed about it as a family, uh, we took on the challenge to come. And it was a difficult challenge in the beginning because um, he, he, he left behind great resources in terms of formalizing a, a medical clinic, formalizing uh, a charter school. We had a, uh, a community garden that was already established. And so, uh, but one of the things that started to happen is that those who were church partners started to withdraw um, until we had to win the relationship again. And that started for me with my board members and with other former staff who had to introduce me to others and therefore let them know that the Hope Center was once again a safe place to give to, a, slave, a safe place to be a part of, that Marvin had the leadership competency and the leadership capacity to actually lead this organization. They had to utilize their leverage in their relationships to open doors for me to enter into so that I would have the opportunity. I wish I could say it was, it was more often, but it grew in that way as individuals begin to know me and trust me and, and the staff that we have. And so today we're predominantly African-American staff um, here at the Hope Center where people get a chance to, that we serve in our community, actually see leaders that look like them. And we, we utilize our staff, all of our staff comes from our leverage. Uh, because of former organizations that I was a part of and former relationships, I was able to leverage. I leverage Angie Daines because she's married to me. So I le <laughs> leverage that relationship for her to be on staff. I leverage the relationship that I had with Marcellus Casey because we knew each other from Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I leveraged the relationship of all of our staff that were formerly part of Kids Across America camps. Because I had relationships with them, they are now here. I leveraged my relationship with our development director who was a volunteer here. And so as a result, she's on staff with us now. So all of our staff are staff here at the Hope Center because of leverage relationships. And that's what leverage does. It allows us to be able to take justice and enact love in action on behalf of others. And that's what we implore for you as well, is to take the steps of that kingdom justice is love in action, irregardless of the difficulty of the situation. For Onesimus, he was grateful that he had Paul in his corner. And for Paul, it was his relationship with Philemon that he could leverage it on behalf of Anesimus. Would you consider the relationships that are around you or the people that are around you and how you have the ability to leverage whatever position, place that you may be in, that whatever gift that God has given to you or authority or influence, that you would leverage it on behalf of others who are in need. And so on behalf of the Hope Center, we appreciate you, we love you, God bless you, and this is always a place that's willing to welcome you to be able to leverage on behalf of others.